And yeah. today we're going to be talking about two more types of real estate, uh, commercial real estate. And one of them is the retail buildings. What defines a retail building? Well, retail commercial space is where people have a retail store. So they sell their products at the retail level. It's not a wholesaling outfit. It's not a distribution center. It's where clients come in to buy the end product. And what are some of the types of buildings that we get into retail? Oh, gosh, it's, it covers a whole spectrum. But the most common one that people are familiar with, and it's one that's a bit iffy as to how long it will survive, is where people buy things like clothing, handbags, shoes, you name it. It's the kind of shop you come across in the center of many towns and in malls and the like. And for decades, I think it's fair to say people, if they needed something, if they needed a new shirt or shoes or whatever, they would go to a retail shopping center. Whereas, as we're all aware, over the last couple of decades, there's been a massive shift towards online shopping. So what does it mean for all of the owners of these retail stores? Are they losing money now that they're having online stores being implemented? Well, many are. I mean, some are doing extraordinarily well still. And I think in particular, some of the really high-end stores, the luxury brands, Chanel and you name it, they tend to still be doing all right. Although I'm sure they've had a downturn with the pandemic. Um, but for many retailers, yeah, they've already gone out of business because they're losing out to the online shoppers. And some of it I can understand. I used to never think twice about going to a shop. If you needed anything, a widget for a project you're working on, you go to the appropriate store. But more and more, it's become apparent that it is easier to do online. You can do comparison price shopping much more readily online than you can when you have to go to a store. And many stores have, in fact, closed down. So I'm thinking of massive chains like even Fry's Electronics, which I think had 17 outlets in the, in the west of the country. They've all closed down because it's hard to compete with the online stores who have much fewer staffing requirements. They have much smaller office space requirements and warehousing requirements. So I can understand that. But one that really surprises me is I would have thought that if you're going to buy something like shoes, you have to go to a physical shoe store because we've all been in shoe shops where you try on and I'm a size eight and a half or nine. Normally you try it on, it doesn't quite fit. With that brand, you're a nine and a half or an eight or whatever the numbers are. And so you have to try them on and walk around in them a bit. And I'm stunned that online shoe stores work as well as they do. And apparently people think nothing of buying three shoes, slightly different sizes, three pairs of shoes to be pedantic, <laughs> and then they send two back. So it seems to be working. So there is a big risk that retail is going out of fashion. And um, if somebody is trying to invest into a retail building, um, what are some of the recommendations that you could give them, given the situation now that online stores are oh, taking gosh. over? Oh, gosh. What is still really crucial is that old saying of the three most important things of location, location, location. Mm -hmm. If you're in the right location, you will always find a tenant. And you know, Mike, it's very interesting. I'm just thinking. I used to shoot these videos that were called Discussions with Dolph. It's not a plug for it or anything, but I did them decades ago before YouTube came out. Mm. And then I was in Tokyo, and in one of my favorite places there's a suburb called Akihabara. And I would find a particular spot which was visually quite stimulating. It had these really wide white lines for the zebra crossing and a railway line overhead disappearing into an infinitesimally small point. <laughs> and it just visually it was very good. And when I shot my first video there, it was a while ago, but they were selling in the store next door to me, Walkman. Now, mm. some of you are probably too young to know what a Walkman <laughs> is, and isn't it sexist? Why is it a Walkman and not a Walkwoman? But anyway, a Walkman <laughs> was a generic term for a cassette player. You'd oh. put a cassette tape in, and some of you don't know what a cassette tape is, but that's how we listen to music. Mm -hmm. And if you went out for the day and you only took three cassettes with you, you only had three bands or three artists that you could listen to. But Walkman were all the range, and how small could you get them, and how long did the batteries last, and could you skip along to the next track by pushing a button. So this shop specialized in selling Walkman. And then about 10 years later, I was back in Akihabara in Tokyo, and I shot another video, and I thought, well, I'll mm. do it from the same location. Oh, nice. That'd be quite fun. Well, Walkman weren't around anymore. In fact, the world had gone on to CDs, and we had CD players the size of Walkman. Um, but they sort of disappeared because at that stage it was MP3 players. It was just before Apple came out with its first iPod. And so the store was full of these solid state silicon-based MP3 players where you had no moving parts. So you mm -hmm. could just listen to music that way and it was all the rage. 
And then just before the pandemic hit, I was back in Tokyo. I love it over there, by the way. I was mm -hmm. fortunate as a kid to learn the language. I love the culture. <laughs> I love how safe it is. I love how clean it is. So I was back in that same spot, and now I thought it's a tradition. I'll shoot another video there. <laughs> and, of course, no one wanted Walkman anymore or CD players or even MP3 players. iPods have disappeared. Now a standard iPhone incorporates the task that used to be performed by an iPod. So they weren't even selling those, and it became an anime store of all the mm. little accoutrement accessories that the anime aficionados use. I should always dumb down my words. People tell me I have too many syllables in my words. But anyway, I think you get the gist <laughs> of what I'm saying. And the point of all of this, and it's a long-winded way of answering your question, is when you've got retail space, a retail premise, retail commercial real estate that is well located, it doesn't matter what happens in the world as far as technology is concerned and trends and cassettes to CDs to MP3 players, you will always find a tenant. And even if portable music is no longer something that you can sell through retail outlets because everyone has it on their phone now, mm -hmm. you can use that space to sell anime bits and pieces. So it just goes to show that the most important feature of retail commercial space is the location. If it's in a location with a lot of foot traffic, you'll find someone who can sell something from there, even if they convert it to a coffee shop. Hmm. Now, not everyone's into coffee. Um, <laughs> I'm not into many drinks. I happen not to be particularly fond of alcohol. It's not for moral reasons or anything. I just don't like it. Maybe that's lucky for me. I happen to quite like coffee, and I've noticed a trend around the world that coffee shops are on the increase. In fact, Vietnam, talking about other places, mm -hmm. Vietnam is the ultimate in cafe society. I've oh, wow. counted seven coffee shops oh. side by side in a row there, all thriving in one building. I took photos of it. There's a Starbucks on the ground floor, and right next to it, there's a Gloria Bean coffee shop, and they were both <laughs> jam-packed full. Oh, they wow. could almost have leased the whole ground floor out to either one or the other, I think they would have done well. My point is coffee is very popular. And I think the store in Tokyo, Akihabara, no longer selling Walkman, CD players, MP3 players, anime, the next thing might be a coffee shop or it might be something else. But the point is, if the location is good, you'll find a tenant. That's right. And I feel like you just have to be creative uh, when it comes to your tenants. Because like if there was a certain business uh, in the past, that doesn't mean that your building won't be having a tenant anymore. You right. just have to be creative and find another business owner who wants to use your building. That's exactly right. And uh, in the case of other types of buildings uh, for commercial real estate, we have found also hospitality buildings, such as hotels, being part of it. So tell us, what qualifies a hotel and how can that be different from residential? Because, I mean, a hotel, people are living in it. But how do the zoning work for making it different from residential. Ooh, I see what you're trying to say. You're trying to trick me into believing that because <laughs> people live in a hotel room, no matter how short the stay is, a one-night stay, a three-night stay, ten nights or whatever, that it is technically residential. I see where you're coming from, but <laughs> I have to say I disagree vehemently, and here's my reasoning. Mm -hmm. According to me, the definition of residential real estate is real estate that people use as residences, And the definition of commercial real estate is real estate that people use for commercial activities. Now, from the hotel room user's perspective, you're not completely wrong. They are kind of using it as an extremely mm -hmm. short-term residential accommodation. Mm -hmm. But from my perspective, the owner of the hotel... And by the way, I've started a hotel brand, so I know a little bit about oh, this. Nice. I don't like to operate the hotel. I lease it out to an operator. Oh. So from the perspective of my real estate, when I own a house, I rent it out to a tenant. It is residential. But when I own a hotel, I lease it out to an operator. It could be a chain, Marriott, Hyatt, you name it. Um, And so from my perspective, it is a commercial operation. I have a commercial long-term lease, a five- or ten-year lease with the operator. And what they do with those premises, they don't make ice cream inside. It's not industrial. <laughs> they lease it out on a short-term basis to... To all the different um, to, to, to tourists. To residential tenants or tourists or whatever. Oh, interesting. But from my perspective, absolutely, it's commercial. And by the way, that's why I don't want to be an operator of hotels, because I would be basically a large-scale, short-term residential real estate operator, mm -hmm. and I prefer commercial. So what are some of the advantages that you have seen now that you own uh, some hotels, of owning hotels? What are some of the advantages that you have seen of having an operator and a team working for you on that? Well, by having an operator, they do all the work. They can busy themselves with 
Did their credit card go through? Did they charge up a meal in the restaurant and did they put the correct room on there? And if they didn't put the correct room on there, was it done inadvertently and they just need to have the mistake corrected? Or did they do it on purpose, trying to palm the expense off to some <laughs> unsuspecting user who may not check the bill? I don't have to deal with any of that. I've just got a long-term lease, 10 years with 10-year rights of renewal, and they pay me the same amount every year. Sometimes leases are written up where they pay a percentage of their gross profit or their net revenue, pay that as part of the rent or not. Um, I'm just concerned with owning the building and leasing it out. Are there any maintenance or um, improvements that you need to do to a building before you can actually lease it out as a hotel? Usually with hotels, the lease document states that the landlord shall keep the building watertight. It's similar to all kinds of commercial real estate. As owner, you have to keep the building watertight. That means if there's a tornado and a portion of the roof is ripped mm. off and the next time it rains, it oh, rains wow. right into the bathtub of one of the <laughs> occupants. As the building owner, you're responsible for fixing up. But when it comes to just about everything else, it's the tenant who looks after that. So the hotel operator will tend to refurbish the building and put new carpets in because they're the ones wearing it out and new curtains. And when there's a plumbing issue, they go in and fix that. So it makes the management of commercial real estate far easier, really, than the management of residential. So tell us a little bit about your experience of becoming a hotel owner in this case. Um, how have you seen working with different brands helped you? Because I know that there's quite a bit of franchises that do um, hotels in this case. How do you go about doing the lease documents? Well, you know, it, it varies case by case. If you want to get a chain operator in, and I'm thinking of brands without giving any bias to or away from, there's Homewood Suites and La Quinta and all those sort of what I'd call a smaller scale brands, and then you've got the, the middle brand, the Marriott's and the Hilton's and the Heights, and then you've got the ultra luxury, you've got the Regus and Four Seasons hotels like that. They all have different requirements. Um, but what I did when, when I was involved with starting a brand is I always look for something different, Marjorie. How mm. can you differentiate yourself from the market? So we talked one time on a podcast about an industrial building where if you deck out the manager's office in a sufficiently salubrious manner, you will find a market for that that wouldn't otherwise be filled. So when it came to hotels, I wanted to think, what can I do differently? And there are plenty of high-end hotel brands with massive big rooms. Mm. But when I stay in a hotel room, I don't normally spend most of my day there. I'm doing things during the day. I go there to sleep, basically. I want mm. to have a shower. I want to clean my teeth, do all that sort of thing, of course. But essentially, I'm asleep there, so I don't need a big room. So we thought, let's create a brand where the rooms are tiny, mm. tinier than most. <laughs> But we can put them in the centers of town because these days when you build a new hotel, usually it can't be in the center of town. It's in the outskirts somewhere. And so you might have an iceberg room in the outskirts, but it's a 20-minute commute into town where you have to mm. be on business. And when it's peak rush hour traffic, you might have difficulty getting a cab or an Uber or a Lyft. So we were able to retrofit our hotel rooms into buildings that most wouldn't use for hotels because the rooms were too small. Our rooms were so small that often they didn't coincide with where there was a window on the oh. outside of the building. And you might say, what, do you mean you had hotel rooms without a window? Mm. Well, yes, we put in these massive big LCD screens and on the screen was an image of what you would have seen had there been a window there. <laughs> and by the way, in case you didn't like that view or it was rainy that day in your town, you could select the Eiffel Tower in Paris oh, or wow. Central Park in New York City. You could have 50 or 100 different images from around the world, people found that more fascinating than having an actual window on some <laughs> dull view that you get in most places, like where I'm mm. staying right now. I've got a view, I've got a window, but I wouldn't say it's something I want to get a painting of. It's pretty <laughs> ugly, so it doesn't matter. We would do things differently. So I don't know if you've traveled much internationally, but oftentimes the plugs that you have on your equipment doesn't fit the sockets in the wall. Mm -hmm. So in our hotels, we had every imaginable plug and voltage and line mm -hmm. frequency that is available around the world. 100 volts from Japan and 110 from North America and 220 from Europe and 240 down under and 50 hertz or 60 hertz and all the different plug configurations. So wherever you were from, your plug would fit in mm -hmm. our sockets. And that ended up being more popular. Internet is becoming increasingly important mm -hmm. in people's lives. We were the first to have fiber optic pipes into every hotel room. Oh, wow. So we guaranteed the fastest internet service. And then, so what if your room is tiny? Our rooms were microscopic. <laughs> but it didn't matter. We also had some of the lowest room rates at the time. It was $65 a night. And oh, we wow. had the highest occupancies. So I think... 
just to riff off the logo of one of the major computer brands, the trick is to think differently. Mm -hmm. I know they said think different, but I think that is not quite as accurate as think differently. If you can think differently, then you've got a market of people who not only like what you've got to offer, but become aficionados and they become loyal followers. That's right. And I feel like it also builds your brand, in this case, as a hotel owner, because every single time that they see, oh, this hotel was made by Dolph. Okay, I better stay there. Because it does give them the assurance that they're going to receive a really good service. And on top of that, like that they're going to have all of these extra little gadgets that you added to the room. And that also adds a lot of value, I believe, for um, any building that you have. Right. And sometimes, Marjorie, the trick is not to determine and dictate what the user of your product should want, but we've got to ask them. So at, at one stage, I became the largest provider of student accommodation in one part of the world. Mm. And I did that not by dictating what they should live in, but I ran what's called focus group meetings. I invited students, hundreds of them at a time, to come to these meetings and voice their interests and what they would want in student accommodation. Mm. Well, they were quite vocal about it. <laughs> I can talk about things like keys, how they got sick of losing their keys and having to pay a $10 fine to get another key made. Why? They said, don't you just make electronic locks? And if we Forget our combination, you can give us a new one and no one can ever lose their key and no one can find a lost key and then use it to get into your room. The security would be better. It went from that level to, if you don't mind me talking about it, a lot of them said, all our student rooms have single beds and you <laughs> seem to delude yourselves that we're not going to get up to things with each other. So the first thing we do <laughs> is we go to the local secondhand store and we buy a double bed mm -hmm. and then we bang up the wall a bit by removing your silly single bed and putting our double bed in. And at the end of our lease, we have to return it and we bang the walls up. Why don't you just give us double beds? We're going to use them whether you approve or not. <laughs> and I'm sorry for it being a bit of a sensitive story, but I thought, dang, that's true. The walls are messed up because they keep changing. And they said, we don't need a full stove in there, but why not a double double hot plate mm. so that we can heat last night's pizza right. again without having to put it in a microwave and of course have a microwave and then they talked about internet connectivity that internet service is hopeless in those things mm -hmm. so we provided we retrofitted buildings with these student accommodation facilities where they had double beds they had hot plates they had fiber optic pipes into the room mm. they had electronic locks they had cameras outside the rooms they weren't worried about being spied on, they were worried about security, that when they open the door at night, someone doesn't, you know, Get their force stuff, you. Yeah. You're right. And so we provided all these things. We were charging $200 a month, more than our nearest competition. Mm. And this is a number that's hard to believe. We had a three-year waiting list because it was so popular. Oh, wow. So my point is, don't delude yourself that you know better as a real estate investor what your clients need. No, ask them. Have focus group meetings and then provide what they unanimously want. And when you do that, when you give people what they want, they're willing to pay more for it. That's right. And I feel like it also uh, makes them feel more special as tenants of yours because they are like, my landlord truly hurt me and he truly uh, wants to do the best accommodations for me to stay in this place. That's right. really cool. Where was these um, student accommodations that you were an owner? Of? This was in the Southern Hemisphere. Oh, yeah. le look at that. So yeah. you mean like which country then? Well, Australia and New Zealand. Oh, nice. And so what would happen is the academic year would be eight or nine months. So we'd right. have three months of the year that these things would be vacant. Mm -hmm. But they were so popular in terms of their high-speed internet access that we turned them into what we called gold card backpacker accommodation. Oh. So these are people wealthy enough to have gold cards, like gold American Express cards or whatever, mm -hmm. and yet they still like to save money. So we would offer them a place to stay and it was, you know, great value and high speed internet and all those features I talked about. And then they could book their next accommodation in the next city on our network. So we had this captive audience who really liked it and they filled the remaining three months and the summer vacations were during the summer when the weather was good, when all the tourists came. Hmm. So it was a perfect balance of how we got 100% occupancy throughout the year. Interesting. So then again, it, in real estate, especially commercial real estate, it all comes to being creative because in this case, you didn't have your tenants. But as long as you are still creative, you can always have a tenant. doesn't matter it's, what time of the year it is. It's Amazing. all about creativity. I keep saying, I'll say it again, the most valuable piece of real estate is the six inches. Give or right take here. an inch or two between your right ear <laughs> and your left ear because it's what you create in that space that ultimately determines your net worth. That is amazing. Thank you so much again, Dolph. Amazing ideas as always. And thank you to our audience for tuning into this episode. See you on the next episode.